I again. Christianity and the Social Crisis, Chapter 5, The Present Crisis. Walter Rauschenbusch on page 215 is dealing with the age of the, mach of the machine, the Industrial Revolution. Then arrived the power machine, and the old economic world tottered and fell like San Francisco in 1906, which, by the way, was the year before this book was published. The machine was too expensive to be set up in the old home workshops and owned by every master. If the guilds had been wise enough to purchase and operate machinery in common, they might have effected a cooperative organization of industry in which all could have shared the increased profits of machine production. As it was, the wealthy and enterprising and ruthless seized the new opening, turned out a rapid flow of products, and of necessity underbid the others in marketing their goods. The old customs and regulations which had forbidden or limited free competition were brushed away. New economic theories were developed which sanctioned what was going on and secured the support of public opinion and legislation for those who were driving the machine through the framework of the social structure. The distress of the displaced workers was terrible. In blind agony they mobbed the factories and destroyed the machines which were destroying them. But the men who owned the machines owned the law. In England the death penalty was put on the destruction of machinery. Suddenly the old masters had to bow their necks to the yoke. They had to leave their own shops and their old independence and come to the machine for work and bread. They had been masters, henceforth they had a master. The former companionship of master and workmen working together in the little shops was gone. Two classes were created and a wide gulf separated them. On the one hand the employer whose hands were white and whose power was great. On the other the wage earner who lived in a cottage and could only in rare and lessening instances hope to own a great shop with its costly machinery. This disintegration of the old economic life has slowly spread, reaching one trade after the other, one nation after the other. Today it is working its way in Russia and India. Longfellow in his village blacksmith has described a master of the old kind. The smith, a mighty man was he, with strong and sinewy hands. Today one son of the smith is nailing machine-made horseshoes on with machine-made nails and repairing the ironwork of farmers which is wrought elsewhere. The other sons have gone into town and are factory hands. One worked in the fluff-filled air of a cotton mill and slept in a dark bedroom. He died of consumption. Thus went the old independence and the approximate equality of the old life. The old security disappeared too. A man could not even be sure of the bare wages which he received for his toil. The machine worked with such headlong speed that it glutted the market with its goods and stopped its own wheels with the mass of its own output. Periodical prostrations of industry began with speculative production and a new kind of famine became familiar, the famine for work. The machine required deafness rather than strength. The slender fingers of women and children sufficed for it and they were cheaper than men. So men were forced out of work by the competition of their own wives and children and saw their loved ones wilt and die under the relentless drag of the machine. The saying that a man's foes shall be they of his own household received a new application. Unlike the old methods, industry could be scattered over the country. The machine now compelled population to settle about it. It was the creator of the modern city. It piled the poor together in crowded tenements at night and in unsanitary factories during the day and intensified all the diseases that come through crowding. Poverty leapt forward simultaneously with wealth. From 1760 to 1818 the population of England increased 70 percent. The poor relief increased 530 percent. Here then we have the incredible paradox of modern life. The instrument by which all humanity could rise from want and the fear of want actually submerged a large part of the people in perpetual want and fear. When wealth was multiplying beyond all human precedent, an immense body of pauperism with all its allied misery was growing up and becoming chronic. 
England was foremost in the introduction of machine industry, and the first half of the 19th century was one of the darkest times in the economic history of England. While the nation was attaining unparalleled wealth and power, many of its people were horribly destitute and degraded. It's hardly likely that any social revolution by which hereafter capitalism may be overthrown will cause more injustice, more physical suffering, and more heartache than the Industrial Revolution by which capitalism rose to power. I'll put a link into Wilberforce's influence. Now, Wilberforce, around 1820, after his great triumph of abolishing the slave trade uh, over a decade before that, had gotten around to addressing some other issues while, while they pressed for the complete abolition of slavery. Wilberforce and his co-workers were turning their attention to the to this very situation that had developed in their lifetimes. That is, over two or three generations, the impoverishments and the pauperism of many of the English people because of the advance of the machines. And he'd written a book, Wilberforce had, called Real Christianity, in which he addressed some of the, the new problems that England saw that were relatively invisible back in the day when England was basically rural and most people lived outside of cities. What were the churches doing to, to offset these sudden changes in, in the, the life of England? So Wilberforce wrote Real Christianity in response to the needs he saw coming over the horizon, the new needs of the people of England for better teaching, for better education. So I'll put a link on to Wilberforce Real Christianity, a series that Vivian did and also to our playlist, tracing the development of this England that Rauschenbusch is deploring here in the extinction of Puritanism in the 1660s and 70s. The series is called, What Has Christ Been Doing These 2,000 Years?